we lift, we every, we voice and we sing, we till and we till and we till and we earth and we heaven, us ring, us ring, we without and we within the harmonizing harmonies, we of liberty, we let our joys rejoice, we shot and we rise, we stay listening. We blue, we sky, we let it resound. We loud, us loud, we loud as the rolling. We rolling, we rolling as loud as the seas. I'm excited to be at King Boston in this moment in time. Boston is a city that hasn't been known to be the most friendly for black and other people of color. And King Boston is a culmination of those ideas and wishes to make Boston an inclusive community and city. It's made up of three parts, the Embrace Memorial, the first memorial built in Boston Common in the last 30 years. Hank Willis Thomas, the renowned artist, is the sculptor that we are engaging for the Embrace Memorial. The King Center for Economic Justice, the first of its kind community research institute, and the Embrace Ideas, a festival in 2022 to bring together Boston's aspirations to be an inclusive and welcoming city. MLK Day is for the MFA a moment of celebration, recognition, of people gathering. It's an expression of who we are, certainly who we must be, which is an institution for all of Boston. MLK Day is a day of people gathering, sharing experiences around art, and learning something about their community and sharing that learning broadly. We've had MLK Day for many, many years. More than 120,000 people have come from all around to celebrate with us. It has been, as I say, joyous and celebratory. I look at Dr. King and Coretta Scott King as black excellence, as black royalty, as uh, people that I aspire to be. And when I think of them, um, and what they've done for me with respect to the criminal justice system, I think about the fact that racial uh, and economic inequality is injustice. Housing inequality is injustice. Environmental racism, which is very real, is injustice. The fact that failing public schools and segregated schools is injustice a lack of access to health care and mental health care is injustice. And we will no longer permit people to willfully look away and pretend they don't see the racial reckoning we find ourselves in right now as a nation. On behalf of all of my colleagues at Citizens Bank, I cannot tell you how proud we are to be getting close to 20 years of celebration with the MFA in this important partnership to celebrate Dr. King's legacy in our local community. This has been a way for the two organizations to come together to really serve the neighborhoods in and around Boston in a very meaningful way that I think touches the lives of so many people who are inspired by the work and legacy of Dr. King. We've organized a series to engage with over 500 community partners to talk about social inequity, racial inequity in our community, and how we might contend with that. I remember my first major holiday here was Martin Luther King Day um, when I started working at the museum. And it was filled, it was filled with all different types of people, young, old, black, white. Um, it was incredible, and it was completely the antithesis of what I thought I was here to do, which is bring in new audiences. But yet the next day, we were right back to it being, you know, this huge cavernous building with echoes and very few people that looked like me, if any at all. So at that point in time, I really started to think about what it means to feel like some place belongs to you. And we um, really have been working hard to get to the continuum of walking over the threshold of that door in Huntington Avenue walking inside of the building and feeling like you are, um, are welcome, you're safe. And then, what makes you come back on your own? What makes you decide that this is the museum that we say belongs to everybody? Um, and that's that sense of belonging, that willingness to walk in and get lost somewhere, take the wrong turn, um, or learn something new about a painting or 
you know, a, some object of art that you've never even thought about before. Um, that is what we want the future to look like of this museum for the young people in the city of Boston, those that are living right across the train tracks on the other side of Huntington Avenue, and also um, the, the ones that are living 10, 15, 20 miles from here. But that is um, the work of becoming an institution where Martin Luther King Day is um, every day. You know, I was involved in the opening of the Powell Arts Center in Chinatown. And I think that was really an extension of the King's kind of philosophy of the beloved community. Because a lot of people don't realize that Chinatowns across the country, they really came into being because of segregation and because of racism. White Americans didn't want to have anything to do with Chinese immigrant laborers 100, 150 years ago. And so they, Chinese immigrants were forced into these kind of small neighborhoods that ended up becoming thriving communities. The work of the Kings has inspired my views on arts and creativity because I think that arts and creativity is really what helps us as a society imagine things that don't currently exist. And the work of the Kings has been all about doing that, imagining a world where we don't have racism, where we don't have sexism, where we've eradicated poverty, we've eradicated hatred. We have to imagine those things because those things don't that, that world has not yet existed. We want to move toward a world where we have achieved all of those things. And without arts and artists and our, cre our own creativity, we would never be able to imagine such a world. And so I think it's essential. It is no longer okay for you to quote Martin Luther King on Martin Luther King Day or Juneteenth now and think you get a pass for what is happening. Um, this man was executed. He was nonviolent and he was executed. And when we are violent, we're executed. When we're nonviolent, we're executed. And this is precisely why we find ourselves where we are as a nation today. So that is what the Kings have taught me. They have inspired me. And that is why I ran to become the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of Suffolk County, which is Boston, Chelsea, Winthrop, and Revere. And I will not dull my shine for anyone because we deserve to be here um, we must demand what we deserve and we shall receive it. On September the 24th, 2019, my mother, who had cleaned offices alongside me, was able to cast her vote for me um, for the first time. Because my mom came here in search of the American dream. Right? She came to this country with very little and was humiliated, was disrespected, was treated less than. But when she and I went to vote that day and my name was on the ballot, I felt like it was our restorative justice moment. I felt like my mom finally realized that that American dream and what she worked so hard for was actually paying off. And it was through the power of that one vote that got me here. So I think that, you know, for me, being first generation, becoming a naturalized citizen, running for office, and helping people recognize their power um, is what I've dedicated my entire life to. But I think that when my mom voted for me on that day, I felt like all of her hard work had paid off. After cleaning offices together, after being humiliated, after being disrespected, after being told to go back to where we came from, to be able to vote, that was the one thing that they couldn't take away from us. So I get, I get emotional when I think about that day because I know how many other folks, you know, are out here feeling disregarded and disrespected. And I think that that power of the vote changes everything. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far. Thou who has by thy might led us 
Hey, this is Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker, and I'm honored to be able to participate in King Boston's Voices on King program. And I want to also take a quick minute to thank and congratulate CEO Amari Paris Jeffries and the rest of the King Boston team for the terrific work you've all been doing. We're excited about the work, and we're excited about the effort to preserve and honor the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King here in Boston, the city where they met and spent some of their most formative years. The work is mostly visible through the form of the embrace on Boston Common. But your work to honor the King's legacy is so much more than a monument. Through your work to establish the King Center for Economic Justice and your continued support of historical and education programming, you are challenging our city and our Commonwealth to stay focused on pursuing the goals the Kings fought for. That mission takes on added importance after 2020 a year where we battled two related pandemics, COVID-19 and structural racism. And as we begin 2021, I believe it's critical that we continue to recognize and uplift the message of Dr. King and Coretta Scott King, because our Commonwealth has much more work to do when it comes to creating more equitable and just society. 
Dr. King once said, we're not satisfied and will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Those words resonate with me and they ground the work of our administration to advance the cause of racial equity. This past year has underscored the importance of never relenting in our fight for a more just society. Throughout 2020 and into this new year, we've seen the disproportionate impact that a pandemic can have on communities of color. There's no doubt about it, black and brown communities have borne the brunt of this virus. COVID underscored the health disparities that exist both here in Massachusetts and around the world. Our administration's response has been constantly mindful of this reality. We've prioritized multilingual public health outreach in our hardest hit communities. We've expanded testing for communities of color through our Stop the Spread program. And as the COVID vaccine comes to Massachusetts, we've prioritized communities of color within our vaccine distribution plan. But even when this pandemic is over, the fact will remain that we have much more work to do to improve health outcomes for people of color. We must also focus on the social determinants of health at the root of these disparities. That's why our administration's committed to expanding our work to, on food security, to address housing instability, and create wealth in communities of color. Dr. King knew that economic justice was at the core of the mission to combat racial inequity. Today we share that belief and it drives our work to create more opportunity for people of color here in the Commonwealth. That's why last year we joined our friends in the Black and Latino Caucus to announce a $60 million investment in home ownership through Mass Housing's Commonwealth Builder Program. It's why we've prioritized grants to minority-owned businesses through our small business relief efforts. And it's why we're expanding the state's supplier diversity program, building on our work to give minority-owned businesses more access to contracting opportunities within state government. This past year also underscored the importance of creating a more just and equitable relationship between police and communities of color. The tragic murder of George Floyd at the hands of police sparked a movement. It prompted thousands of people to push for change in a way that Dr. King would have been proud of. In Massachusetts, that movement led to bipartisan police reform legislation that significantly increases accountability and transparency for law enforcement. I was proud to sign this legislation, which is one of the most comprehensive approaches to police reform in the country since the tragic loss of George Floyd. It's a big step forward in promoting racial justice. So let me close with this. There's no doubt that we have a long way to go toward realizing the vision and the goals of Dr. Martin Luther King and Karata Scott King. There are deep and systemic challenges for people of color across our society. But I'm proud that in Massachusetts, we've pursued these goals with collaboration and determination. We recognize our common goals, we listen to all voices, and we work together to achieve results and move forward. I look forward to continuing to work with all of you as we continue to work toward the world the Kings envisioned. I know King Boston will be a crucial part of that effort, so I want to close by thanking you for everything you're doing, and God bless. The best way to utilize Dr. King's work and ensure equity in education is to make sure we're listening to families, educators, and our administrators. We need to decolonize our curriculum in Boston Public Schools. As a young girl, I experienced racism in our city through our school system. I was bused during the desegregation court-ordered busing of the 1970s. I saw firsthand how our school systems are failing our young people. Our schools are still segregated and quality is still the number one issue for families. Our children deserve better. We need to do more to live out Dr. King's legacy. Drawing inspiration from Dr. King and Coretta Scott King can absolutely effectuate meaningful change in the criminal justice system. We need everyone involved. When we look back at what the Kings did dating even back to the 50s, um, they used their minds and their bodies. They were uh, deliberate with respect to their marches, with respect to civil unrest, uh, with respect to using the First Amendment to their benefit. And then they also utilized the courts and I, every day as the district attorney of Suffolk County, try to not only use my mouth and my brains as often as I can, uh, speaking to young people and empowering them, explaining processes to them because they do understand it. Um, you can enter our criminal legal system at the age of 12 now. They need to understand the system and they are fully capable of doing so. But I also utilize the courts in every way possible to make sure that equity 
and justice and inclusion is happening every single day. And when we use the courts, we win. Um, if you have questions about that, Google us, because <laughs> we win all the time, because we're on the right side of history. So I encourage people to not think that the kings were so long ago. Um, we are in the same fight that they were in before, and I am proud to be leading uh, in this area. At City Life, we encounter uh, lots of, of people who say that they, are, that they are fighting for racial justice and racial equity, but we must be moderate in our approach. We must go slower. And at City Life, we say, absolutely not. The time for justice is always now. The time for direct action is now, is yesterday. The time for people learning about our history, learning about the power relationships that, that uh, stifle our ability to access basic human rights and that, st and that stifle our dignity, the time is now to overturn power relationships. Some people would ask, why do you need to have an arts facility in Chinatown? Don't you really just need jobs and housing and education? And of course, Chinatown and all working class communities need all of those things, but we don't just need those things. We also need access to arts. We also need access to all of those other things that just make, make life worth living, that make us human. Access to capital uh, is critically important. So we have committed $10 million through grants and through other charitable giving to strengthen local communities. In addition to that, We've also committed to providing over $500 million in new capital to help small businesses, diverse businesses, housing uh, issues, uh, to help finance these really important issues in our society today. The concept for the love story mural, knowing the history between Coretta Scott and Martin Luther King that attended 12 Baptist Church, which was historically located where the development is at currently. So the content behind the mural with the Roxbury love story, it has a historical context between Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott that actually attended and participated at the 12th Baptist Church that existed there. Rumor is that uh, they've had their first line of communication and met each other through a phone conversation in which, you know, Martin told Coretta that he loved the way her voice sound and they took off from there. She was attending the New England Conservatory and he was going to BU. If you look at the mural, there's a phone line that connects in between the two. I feel like the line symbolizes the journey that the both of them are on in representation for our people. And they demonstrated that strength through the ideologies of their family. I mean, there's so many ways to keep the work of the Kings alive. I would say that, you know, it's happening all over the city. It's happening um, in this museum every day. And um, that for me is, is not as much the question as is what happens when you get tired? What happens when you get frustrated? What happens when you feel like your work is not moving fast enough? And I think those are the moments when invoking Dr. King and his perseverance and his um, tirelessness and his willingness to continue moving forward, even though um, his life was in peril, but he was doing that for um, the benefit of all of us people of color actually being able to live into their their civil rights their human rights something that we actually were born with um, and i think those are the moments where we best think of him and his spirit in 2017 we did a strategic plan and we said we must be an institution of boston and for boston we must be outward facing we must work in deep and consistent partnerships with those in our communities uh, and we have done so with intention. The key is for us to create an institution and sustain an institution where people feel they belong. MLK Day is that invitation. You belong here. You create content with us. You respond to content. You share it with others. And if you feel that on that day, maybe you'll come back. Maybe you'll bring your friends, your family. You'll share it with others. So it's an invitation. It's an invitation to feel that this institution belongs to you, and that is our highest, highest goal. We think if we do this enough, if we do this with consistency and with real conviction, 
our audiences will expand and we will therefore be in greater service to our communities. And I want to thank Citizens, a partner of ours for 19 years, a great community leader, a builder of content with us. They too believe in the notion that the MFA belongs to all, that is the place of gathering, a pleasure of sharing for all. My name is Paul Grogan, and I'm the president of the Boston Foundation, Greater Boston's Community Foundation. We are active participants and supporters of all these related efforts to honor uh, the memory and contributions of Dr. Martin Luther King and his wife Coretta, particularly during the period of their lives that they were right here in Boston. Not as many people know that as should, and part of what this is all about is reminding people that Dr. King and his wife were here for a very formative period of time, and it's almost a, a desire on Bostonians' part to lay a bigger claim uh, on Dr. King and all that he has meant uh, to Boston and our society and to elevate that, uh, uh, that relationship. And the Boston Foundation, as I said, has been very involved in that, in, uh, in hosting the King Boston effort, in making a significant financial commitment in the monument that will be done. Um, so we are very, very uh, aligned uh, with these events. But we have no illusions that it's enough. And the underside of the celebration and recognition that's going on here is that we are far short of the ideals that Dr. King laid out for us, the hopes that he had for Boston and particularly other urban communities. So let this as well be a time when we just resolve to speed up and expand our efforts to bring opportunity to everyone who needs it. That's the real way we can honor Dr. and Coretta King. Thank you. We're excited to be collaborating King Boston and the MFA for our third annual Dr. Martin Luther King Day celebration. One of the things that I think we've all realized during the pandemic, during the racial unrest, is that we are stronger together. And a value that we hope emerges post-vaccine, post-cure, is that we are stronger together than we are apart. There are too many men and flags lifted each intent on breaking a vow. Every bird of the witnessing sky knows the voices of those below are honeycombed by death and time passing. Stuff us full of singing, protest songs to match the march till we toil enough to belong to the earth too. The list of our dead is too heavy and we've had to carry ourselves in the heaven of our mouths, dying for the country to ring our names, demanding the bell to ring an anthem other than this blood tune lined with our bones, we gutsy, always sharpening our teeth. The smile in the face of murder is harmony's courage, and what have we to be afraid of? There's nothing more terrifying than our liberty, so we locked arms. We hiked feet. We let our bodies home to cross bridges, never mind our backs, nor the wounds spining them. We rejoicing, despite the standby boys and their faulty flags rising us on our way. Hell, high water, a highway line with nostalgia as confederate as statues, we unpetrified moving like the waters, us spiral forward, make you a listening people. We ain't going back to the skies this soon, us come back. Never let anyone defy the skin our mothers gave. It make envy of the sun. It resound color chimes off the nape loud. We strut the moon, we flying people. Ain't as asphalt as you like, us enchanting as the ocean. Unmarked grave and keep rolling past the horizon, marching like the sea. Tonight, in need of you and God, I move imperfect through this ancient city. Quiet, no one hears, no one feels the tears of multitudes. The silence thickens. I have lost the shore of your kind seasons, who will hear my voice, nasal against distinguished actors. Oh, I am tired of voices without sound. I will rest on this ground full of mass hymns. You've been here since I can remember, Martin. 
From Selma to Montgomery, from Watts to Chicago, from Nobel Peace Prize to Memphis, Tennessee. Unmoved along the angles and corners of aristocratic confusion. It was a time to be born, forced forward a time to wander inside drums, the good times with eyes like stars and soldiers without medals or weapons, but honor. Yes, and you told us, the storm is rising against the privileged minority of the earth from which there is no shelter in isolation or armament. And you told us, the storm will not abate until a just distribution of the fruits of the earth enables men and women everywhere to live in dignity and human decency.